Hey everyone and welcome to our online service. It's so good to be back from our World Conference. And of course, we are on this series of values. And whenever we talk about values, it's how we can bring our cares and concerns onto God as well. And in our prayer time, I want to exhort you, encourage you with this verse in 1 Peter 5, 6-7. The Bible says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. And sometimes, friends, we can quote the second half of this verse without quoting the first half of this passage, which talks about how we're called to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. What does that mean exactly? It means even in times of trial, even in times of crisis, that we come to an end of ourselves, that we come to an end of our own ways, and we humble ourselves under the sovereign, mighty power of God. Because at the end of the day, friends, it is only God that is truly in control. Think about all the areas of our lives. Think about all the challenges that we go through. Ultimately, it is God's hand that covers us and guides us. Regardless of our strengths, regardless even of our weaknesses, that we are called to submit ourselves to His sovereign hand, His sovereign power over our lives. And even for me, as I go through certain physical challenges just recently, I'm reminded of this, that I'm called to humble myself under His sovereign power. That at the end of the day, all good things comes from Him. All blessings comes from Him. At the proper time, He will exalt us. And that's why it's so important to realize this because the verse that precedes this says this, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Friends, I pray that even as we humble ourselves before God, He will give us grace. The grace to go through all the challenges, the grace to live this life, and the grace to thrive in this life. And verse 7 goes on to say, casting all your anxieties on Him. It's almost as if the, the condition to cast the anxieties on Him depends on whether we humble ourselves before Him. And ultimately, last but not least, it's because God cares for us. Friends, God cares for every need that we have in this life. God cares about every detail in our lives. And that is the loving nature of God. He loves us and He cares for us beyond our natural comprehension. Let us pray. Father, we just thank You for this opportunity to be able to be loved and cared for by a perfect Father, by an almighty God, by a God that is sovereign above every sickness and even every care and every challenge that we're going through. And I pray right now for everyone that is listening over on this online service that you would bless them, you would be with them even as they cast the anxieties on you and humble themselves under your mighty hand, that you will lift them up in proper time because you care for us. We ask and pray all this in your precious name. Amen and amen. And now let's get ready for the Word of God. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this segment of Meditating on the Word of God. And as you know, in the previous month, we did a series on spiritual quotient. The idea behind this was to alert you and to open your eyes to the truth of a spiritual world. And we did say that we mentioned five verses out of the book of Ephesians, beginning with in the heaven, or rather ending with the words in the heavenly realms. We said that in the heavenly realms is where, is where all our blessings are, where our strength and power reside, and it is where our manifold wisdom is. And finally, it is also where our struggle is. And our struggle, as we've said in previous messages, is with the thief. The thief we found in John chapter 10, verse 10, that says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but God or Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the full or in abundance. The thief, as we said, is the word kleptes, and the word to steal is the word klepto. And we talked about how the thief steals from us through temptation, deception, condemnation, and accusation. We even saw how he actually cages us to destroy us. 
Then in October, at the beginning of October, we shifted to what does the thief actually steal from us? Knowing this is important because knowing what he's trying to steal alerts us further into how and why he's stealing from us. Matthew chapter 6, we began in October, verse 19 says, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, or where thieves break in and steal. And here we find the word thieves, which is the same word in John chapter 10, verse 10, kleptes. We also find the word steal, which is the same word in John chapter 10, verse 10, klepto. And finally, it explains to us exactly what the devil or the thief steals from us. It is our treasures or thesaurus, or basically the things that are valuable to, for, to us and for us, chief of which is God himself or our relationship with God. Obviously, he can't steal God, but he can steal our relationship with him. Finally, in verse 21, we said, for where your treasure is, or Jesus said, there your heart will be also. Our first message was about the values-driven heart and how this connects to vision, which we discussed last week. And today we see what he really steals or even how he does it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 continues, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And here we find one of the first clues to understanding this message. No one. No one can. In other words, don't try to attempt to do this because you and I can't do it. This idea of serving two masters will fail us. There's no one who can ever do that because mastery is being mastered over. In other words, somebody takes control over our lives. Further, it says you cannot serve both God and money, and it's either God or money that you will be serving. The bottom line is a values-driven heart will someday deal with this idea of money. Much of life will be a conflict in this area of our lives. Fact is, we need money, and if we're honest with ourselves, we want money, and Jesus has nothing against money. The difference is he wants to make sure you're not serving it, but you're serving God. The point is, like anything else, it ends with this conflict of life in business, whether family, whatever it is you're doing, there will be this conflict of who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God or money? Thus, I've entitled this message, Mastering Money. To begin with, how does money master us? And this is the beginning point of what I want to explain. As I've explained, we need it. At some level, we want it and Jesus has nothing against it. The issue is who are you serving or what are you serving? So that how does money actually master us? Well, first of all, the verse is clear. It draws our hearts. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Now notice the words, hate. That's not a thing in your head. That's a thing in your heart. Love, devoted, or addicted to, or despised. These are matters of the heart. And where our heart is or where our value is, there our heart will be drawn. And particularly, one of the most powerful things you're going to find is money. In fact, it is likened to God. It is so powerful, it can literally become your God, your master, or the very thing that you serve. How does money master us? It draws our hearts. Secondly, we worry about it. Now, further in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about what life, about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or even your clothes or what you will wear. Notice that right after he talks about this idea of serving God and money, the word worry comes up. Worrying about life in one way or the other is about money. In fact, the more, when you really think about it, it probably does not escape your mind every day of your life. And that's the reality. That's the conflict. And that's why it's important to decide who you're going to serve, because that conflict will make you make decisions either way. How does money master us? It draws our hearts. We worry about it. And down in chapter 6, verse 31, it actually says this. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? There it is again, this idea of worrying. And how how do you know you're being mastered by money? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. It's when you start running after these things or your time is consumed, your worry is consumed because your heart's been driven to that direction. That's how money masters us, takes control of us and makes us make wrong decisions that put money ahead of God. Now, the second thing you need to understand is why you don't want money to master you. To understand that, 
let me give you my second point, a contrast of God and money. Now, first of all, if you want to understand the difference, God is stable, money is not. If you're too young or too old to understand this, you need to understand something about money. It's never there all the time. God is. It is usually unstable as the economies change in our lives, as currency fluctuations happen, as wars, as oil prices change. Money is not stable at all. However, God is. Now, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, In Him, in God, for in Him were created all things in heaven and on earth. Think about it. How stable God is. Everything that you see in creation, things both in heaven, which you do not see on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Nothing could be more stable. Now, more than that, it says, verse 17, he's before all things and in him, all things hold together. Take God out of the equation, you have a very unstable situation. In contrast, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 5 says, Cast but a glance at riches, and they're gone. For they will sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. When you put yourself under the mastery of money, you put yourself in a very unstable situation rather than putting yourself under the mastery of God who is stable. Secondly, God is infinite, money's not. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is without reach. You're the infinite God who made the heavens and the earth. Think about the unlimited vastness of the galaxies and think about how big the earth is and how unlimited the resources of God is. In Luke chapter 18, verse 27, Jesus said, what is impossible for man is possible with God. In other words, money, there are certain things it cannot answer. It cannot answer broken relationships. It cannot answer some of our health issues. It cannot answer some of the things in life. Depression and some things cannot be resolved by money. But God is stable and is infinitely unlimited. Money is not. Finally, God satisfies money does not and cannot. Psalm chapter 107 verse 9 says, For he satisfies the longing of the soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. That's the amazing thing about God. When we put ourselves under the mastery and the sovereignty and the rulership of God, our soul is satisfied and our hungry souls are filled with really the good things in life, the valuable things in life. For the most part, that's him. In contrast, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with his income. It's This too is vanity. It tells us that we will not be satisfied. And by the way, let me just tell you the truth. The truth is through the years, the decades that I've lived on this earth, I found this to be true. Money never satisfies. You're always in need of more and more things and even the abundances of life. You're never content. You've got two shoes, three shoes, five shoes. You got Nike, you got Adidas, you got, you got more, 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 because at the end of the day, this too is vanity. The contrast of God and money is clear. God is stable, money is not. God is infinite, money is not. God satisfy, money does not. Which brings me to my final point. How do you actually master money? Well, first of all, make God your master. The idea is that God does not master money. God masters you and masters your heart. And when that heart becomes right, you're able to master money. Back to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? At the end of the day, there will be conflicts in our hearts. Trust me when I tell you, you're going to be conflicted if you're a boss. You don't want to retrench your people. But because your company's losing money, you're going to be conflicted and you're going to have to decide whether you're going to do it or not. And it's a money issue. You're going to have conflicts about where your kids are going to go to school, where you're going to give this thing. You're going to leave an inheritance. Conflicts about money will keep happening. And that's why it's critical to make sure who your master is, because it's not about the conflict, whether you're going to have a conflict or not. It's about what decision are you going to make once you face the conflict. 
The funny thing about most believers or Christians is they think that conflict's not real. The fact of the matter is your life is full of conflicts. The question is, who is your Lord and what will you do after you encounter the conflict? Verse 47 says, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and what puts them into practice. It's not about the concepts. It's not about the thinking. It's not the fact that there's an absence of conflicts. The question is, what are you going to do when you encounter the conflicts? He says, if you do this, I will show you what you're going to look like. There's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And what is that? Do it. Rather than just talk about it, do you actually do it? He says, when the floods came and the torrent struck, that house could not be shaken because it was well built. It was stable. It was lasting. It was something that stood the test of time. Why? Because you've learned to make God your master. And how do you make sure that God is your master? How do you make sure you master money? Number one, make God your master. How do you do that? Effectively, come to him daily. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Money will not give you rest. Money will demand more things from you. Money will, your bosses, and your, and I'm not saying something bad about your bosses. The fact is you're going to do it because you want more money. And it will keep getting you burdened and weary, and it will not give you rest. Jesus, on the other hand, says, if you come to me daily, all of you are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, this idea of slavery. Yoke is something that's put upon you, a a burden, a weight. And he says, if you take my yoke, it's actually good for you because you will learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So how do you master money? First of all, make sure God is your master. Number two, come to him daily. And finally, enjoy the love of your master. One of my favorite all-time verses in the Bible is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. By the way, just to be clear, God's not saying he hates money. Jesus actually says, I will add all these things to you. It's the love of money. Keep your lives free. Free from the love of money, be content with what you have. Why? Because when you do that, you will see and understand how much God loves you. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I remember the day I read this verse. I used to think that that verse was something about just the presence of God. And then I realized this verse, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, is directly connected to money. And the more I understood that, the less I had love for money or be worried about money or be mastered by money, but went under the mastership and the lordship of my God. How do you master money? Make God your master. Come to him daily and enjoy his love. Let me summarize this message for you. How does money master us? It draws our hearts. We worry about it. We end up serving it or running after it. Secondly, The contrast of God and money. Why you don't want money to be your master. God is stable. Money is not. God is infinite. Money is not. God is a good master. Money does not. Or money God satisfies. Money does not. And finally, how do you master money? Well, first of all, make God your master. Come to him daily. Enjoy the love of your master. Join me in a short proclamation of Jesus. Pick up a piece of bread and a cup as you pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can proclaim your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and most of all, your love for us. That we don't have to be under the servitude and master and be mastered by money, but we can be mastered by you and we can serve you, thus be able to master money ourselves. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. If you have not yet downloaded the app, the SQ app will help you pray, meditate, proclaim and fellowship, and come to Jesus every day. Get the app, download it, click this code so you can get in the app and start your day praying, meditating, proclaiming, and fellowshipping with Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you, Pastor Joey, for the word. And friends, I want to remind us, let's submit all our cares, our worries, the concerns of this world to God because He cares for you. And right now we've come to this time of giving in our worship as well. 
And Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for His name in serving the saints, as you still do. It comes back to this. God is not unjust. God is a good Father. Even as we give, even as we show other people the love of God in His name. Friends, I want to encourage you that God is not unjust. He looks at all that we do. He looks at all that we give and He honors us back in return. Let us pray. Father, we thank You again that we can give unto You what You have first given to us. And we pray that, Lord, You will bless the work of our hands even as we continue to exalt and honor the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you for giving. And of course, these are the instructions. We are all familiar with this. You can scan to give or use the QR code that is provided. I've got a really exciting announcement before you log off. Don't log off yet. We have water baptism that is coming ahead. 4th November, Saturday, 9 a.m. at City Hub 2 at the pool area. Scan the QR code if you're interested or if you have friends and family that are interested to get baptized. Just scan the QR code and you can register there. And of course, last but not least, our Mandarin Fellowship happening on Saturday as well. In the evening at 6.30 p.m., you can WhatsApp this number that is provided over here. So if you have Mandarin-speaking friends or family members that will love to get into fellowship, yeah, not to be on their own, but really to get into fellowship and get to know others, you can just WhatsApp the number that is provided and the person that is in charge will get back to you on all the details that you need. And of course, friends, again, just wishing you a wonderful and amazing week ahead. Don't forget, God is with us in every detail. He cares for you. God bless you and have a wonderful week ahead. Lift you high, you are